So, uh, first of all, uh, I have to present myself. Uh, most of you don't know me. My name is Marianne Marinov. Uh, I'm CEO of OneH. Uh, uh, I'm co-organizing uh, uh, OpenFest. I'm helping for other conferences. Uh, I'm system administrator uh, since uh, 96. Yeah, I'm one of those guys, as uh, uh, Stefan told you. Uh, yes, I prefer the old ways uh, sometimes. Sometimes, not every time. And uh, the first web day that uh, at which uh, I went, uh, I presented a similar talk about wall balancers. No, the second, sorry, the second web tech that uh, I went. Uh, it was wall balancing ISPs. And since then I'm still wall balancing stuff. Uh, so this is why I chose uh, Nginx uh, uh, as a wall balancer as my subject for uh, today. And also uh, Bogomil told me this would be the best subject for you guys. So first of all, why would you choose uh, uh, Engines. Isn't there something that is uh, better, faster, more uh, economic for your resources and everything else? Uh, most probably yes. But uh, the other tools uh, have some issues and I'll talk a little bit about this. First of all, we'll start with pure IP tables balancing. Uh, who here knows what IP tables is? For the rest of you guys, uh, it's a firewall. And with the firewall, there are some magic comments that I can write there. And uh, when a packet comes to my interface, I can decide to which of the 5, 10, or 100 machines I can forward that. That's the easiest way. The second way is IP route 2. Uh, this is uh, pure Linux uh, IP routing. We can route a packet based, uh, wall balance the packets and route, route them to different servers. Uh, whenever we want. Uh, yes, uh, sysadmin hackery, you can do it. People have done it. Pe uh, people are still doing it. So it works. The other thing is both of these uh, ways are problematic because these are static rules. They don't care about your sessions. They don't care uh, how, uh, how many connections do you have to your server. They don't care if the packet is for SSL or uh, a pure HTTP. So uh, they don't have the knowledge. And without knowledge, they're stupid. And they're very, very stupid. Uh, they can break your sessions. They can break uh, uh, a lot of uh, issue. Uh, they can create a lot of issues on your servers. So uh, then uh, Linux v, v server came. Uh, it's a short term. Uh, usually, you would see it as LVS on uh, a lot of uh, documentation. This is uh, similar to IP tables, but uh, with a kernel module that uh, actually allows you to uh, decide how you would distribute your world across uh, the machines. Usually, all three of these are used for uh, network layer balancing. I mean, uh, packets. Maybe sometimes connections, but mostly packets. Then we go to HA proxy. HA proxy is a uh, highly available proxy. Uh, it gives you uh, high availability. Uh, it gives you checks to the remote servers. It uh, gives you very small server footprint. Uh, it also has SSL support, but it has limited SSL support. Like you can put uh, one side there. Uh, it doesn't have full SNI support. Uh, does any one of you here knows what SNI is? Okay, so I should explain this first. Uh, when you uh, do an SSL connection to a web server, uh, in order to uh, ensure that it's secure, first both the client and the server exchange some secrets between them. And while they're doing this exchange, the web server uh, is telling you the certificate of the website which is very, very important because usually when you're doing SSL, when you're creating an SSL web uh, vhost in Apache or uh, server definition in Nginx, you have one certificate for this particular uh, domain. So for example, if you're uh, using uh, sample.com, uh, you would have certificate for sample.com that covers only this domain name, right? And uh, what if this is uh, on this IP you have uh, three more uh, 
domains, so three more uh, virtual hosts. One for example.com, one for uh, my.com, and so on. And you access this IP, and the server gives you the certificate for uh, sample.com while you actually typed in your browser uh, my.com. This is a completely different site. So uh, a few years back, uh, I think two years ago, uh, or, or a little bit more, uh, I may be mistaken, uh, the open SSL guys uh, decided, okay, this is a very poor design of our API. So we will make it so that uh, while the client is sending his request, usually in HTTP 1.1, uh, you are sending a header called host uh, that uh, in which you uh, add your domain, like sample.com, host sample.com. And the web server decides based on this header in which uh, virtual host you enter in the configuration file. Perfect. With SSL, the server didn't receive that and didn't read that at all. So SNI uh, was introduced to handle this problem. So while uh, the client and the server are exchanging their initial secrets uh, to make this uh, secure connection, the client is also sending the host information and the server can choose based on this, the certificate. This is very important because now you can host multiple websites on a single IP <laughs> that have different SSLs. Sorry. So uh, this is a problem. You don't have it in uh, HA proxy. And uh, you, you need it when you're hosting a lot of stuff. Because your site usually is not only a single domain. Usually you have subdomains like uh, user area, like support, like uh, uh, images, like something else. Uh, you know that you don't use a single host for your website anymore, or at least most of us don't do it. So in this case, uh, you have to have multiple IPs. But multiple IPs are problematic because when something dies, you have to move that IP somewhere else. And uh, these are multiple things that you have to do. And you don't want to do that. So uh, the other thing, okay, Varnish. Varnish is a very good uh, transparent pro uh, proxy for you. And Varnish 4 actually supports SSL, so it's nice. I haven't read uh, does it support SNI because uh, Varnish 4 uh, is new still. And uh, in terms of performance, okay, uh, before performance, even Apache can do load balancing for you. It has the modules there, it has the functionality. You can do load balancing even with Apache, dirty old Apache. But then uh, we go for performance. The first three uh, methods are the most, uh, you can get the most performance out of there because uh, they're in the kernel inside the Linux kernel. Nothing goes to the user space, nothing goes to an application there. You simply configure the kernel and it does its job. The problem there is uh, functionality. You're missing a lot of functions. So uh, the other HA proxy, perfect. Maybe the best performance you can get uh, inside the user space. There are some other proxies here that I haven't mentioned that are a little bit faster, like uh, two times faster than uh, HA proxy, but uh, they're niche. I, uh, I mean that they're built uh, uh, by companies like Facebook for their internal applications, not for a uh, public website. Uh, you can find them on the web on GitHub, so uh, it's not a very big issue. Now, let's look at load balancing uh, at the beginning. First of all, usually when you're defining a load balancer, you would be thinking about one machine, but uh, most probably you shouldn't. Because uh, if one machine uh, is the center of your infrastructure, it means that uh, this is a single point of failure. When it dies, all of your infrastructure, infrastructure dies. So uh, for starters, usually when you're def defining old balancers, you would start at least with two. And when you have two old balancers, usually you need to have to IP addresses. Uh, you configure this in your DNS zone, sample.com is going, uh, it has two A records, one 10.0.0.1 and 0.0.2, okay? Two servers. Everything is fine. The traffic goes to one server, goes to the other server, and they will balance the traffic behind them. Then something happens, and one of the wall balancers dies. 
this is when you actually move the IP address from uh, that world balancer to your, to your second uh, world balancer. If you have more world balancers, you can decide to uh, which you want to uh, move this IP. You don't want to leave this IP offline because half of those DNS uh, requests will return one. And in this case, actually, most of them will return one because it's uh, more like 60-40 DNS balancing. So uh, most of your requests will go to this missing IP. So you want that IP live as soon as possible. This is the first thing that you have to think when you start uh, designing your infrastructure with World Balancer. So at least uh, two machines, if your, machine, uh, if your infrastructure is big, more. And how to calculate more? Here, I have written it. You need a, at least the amount of all balancers that can handle all the, your web traffic. So uh, if your web traffic is uh, 200 megabits, you cannot have a world balancer that has only a 100 megabit pipe. If you have a world balancer that is uh, one, uh, one gigabit, everything is fine, until your traffic is two gigabits, or at least a little bit more than one gigabit. Because when you move the IP to this uh, single world balancer, you're fucked. So uh, try to measure your traffic. And the second thing that you have to calculate is CPU. If you have a lot of traffic, like a gigabit of traffic, uh, usually you're using a lot of CPU to move that traffic around. So if you don't have enough resources on your world balancers, uh, even though the pipe is big enough, like 10 gigabits, if you don't have the CPU, you hog that world balancer and everything dies again. Memory on world balancers usually is not a problem, but I say usually. If you decide to combine the world balancer with uh, cache behind it, um, you have to be sure, be sure you have enough resources to handle the cache for all of your load balancers. Then, uh, how do we move that stupid IP from one machine to the other? This is a problem that has been solved so many times, like at least 10 times. And uh, there are uh, homemade solutions like sysadmins like to ping something and if it, dies, if it doesn't re require, okay, uh, bring up the IP here. These homemade solutions uh, work for uh, some cases, but uh, in most cases they don't. So you have uh, uh, protocols like uh, VRRP, uh, Virtual Router Redundancy uh, Protocol, and you have a daemon for uh, Linux and BSD that uh, supports this. And uh, it, both of these machines, or all of these machines, depending how many uh, load balancers you have, they speak this protocol on uh, broadcast or multicast, def uh, depending on how you have uh, configured it. And uh, when one dies, the, others, the other is moving the MAC address. Keep it in mind, this is layer two, so this is the MAC address and the IP address on the other machine. So uh, the router that actually uh, routes the traffic to your machines will never notice that uh, your machine disappeared because the MAC address haven't changed for that IP. It simply moved to the other machine. Very nice. Uh, it works uh, very good because when the other machine or mm, the machine that had the IP before that uh, comes back, you sim uh, it simply starts the uh, connection with the other VRRP uh, servers and it knows that it shouldn't get the IP now. You can manually move it later to that machine or you can configure it, okay, I, I came back, I want my IP and everything is fine. This is a configuration that you're doing. On the same level, layer two, there is uh, Keep Alive D. Keep Alive D implements VRRP, so uh, you have the same thing, but it also uh, keeps the information about your uh, firewall connections. So if one machine dies and you lose the connection information, like uh, was this, uh, uh, is this packet that is coming to me uh, from a TCP connection that I already have? Like, uh, does it have uh, only SYN or SYNAC uh, uh, flags in the connection? 
you don't know if you don't copy the, the state of the firewall constantly and keep alive the, the uh, does this for you again this is layer two so it moves the mac address also with uh, the ip address for more complex uh, situations or for situations where you don't really want to uh, install and work with keep OIB and uh, GRRP. Uh, I, I prefer CoreSync with Pacemaker or OpenAce or Siemen with Pacemaker. Pacemaker is a very old software. Actually, it evolved from one uh, uh, from other software called uh, Heartbeat. And uh, I have been talking about this since 2005. 10 years I'm talking about have available systems with pacemaker and heartbeat. So, uh, what what does uh, these two softwares do? Uh, first, Corsing is uh, combining all of uh, the information uh, across uh, all of your machines. Like if you have five machines, Corsing would know which machine is up, which machine is down, uh, which machine is behind. These are the three states that are very important for a cluster. So uh, CoreSync will distribute this knowledge across all of the machines and uh, can do it in a sub-second manner. You can configure it in milliseconds, define, uh, depending on what you want to do. Then you have Peacemaker. Peacemaker is uh, the decision-making part of the software. Uh, if you have uh, an IP address and you have a uh, database server, that should be on the same machine. You configure Pacemaker and tell it, okay, I want when this, uh, this IP is moved to move the uh, database server also. If you have like a replication for MySQL, for example, you have master slave replication. When one, uh, one IP is moved to the other machine, it also knows that it should promote the slave server to a master state and when the, uh, the dead machine uh, is resurrected, <laughs> uh, you get uh, Peacemaker knows that on this machine, it should make the machine slave of the other, of the first machine. And it knows this, uh, it keeps this uh, knowledge within itself. So uh, you can configure it pretty easy to manage highly available systems. Actually, this is the standard for highly available systems with Linux. Uh, so, Let's go to engines, right? Uh, if you have your two load balancers and you have some web nodes here, right? Everything looks fine, everything is uh, very good until you notice this machine here. Uh, the problem here is that, uh, okay, uh, you have two load balancers that each have uh, an algorithm on which to select the, other, the, uh, the next web node to send the request. Right, well, balancers receive a request and they send it to a web server. That's that's it, nothing else, right? The problem is that you have now six machines here and two old balancers and these two don't know how many connections each have sent to each of the web nodes. If uh, you're doing round robin and some of the web nodes uh, start uh, uh, replying a little bit slowly and you have configured engines uh, to check the slowness of the requests, then uh, maybe both of the uh, web of uh, the wall balancers will try to avoid uh, avoid the uh, small uh, the not small uh, the the small uh, web servers. They will uh, avoid them. Okay, that's uh, not a problem. But at certain point, this may happen. Both of the world balancers are sending multiple connections to one uh, web node, so they can overload it. First, okay, they, they would overload this one uh, here and it will die. Fine, no problem. Uh, they will continue with the next one. <laughs> and at certain point, all of your web nodes will die because uh, these two are not talking to each other. A problem that you have to solve. Usually, uh, people don't think about this problem until it hits them. And it's a problem like, uh, the talk before, uh, Stefan talked about load balancing a little bit. The problem is that uh, your application may uh, start uh, to break on a few of the web nodes and this may cascade to all of your web nodes simply because your uh, load balancers are stupid. You have to keep this in mind 
and uh, let's talk about how we do this uh, with Nginx. You have the upstream configuration. This is a block of uh, lines in uh, Nginx where you define the web servers uh, that uh, you would be connecting to. Depending, okay, it, I am talking about web servers, but uh, engines can talk directly to your applications. Don't need, uh, doesn't need to uh, talk to web servers on your web nodes. So it has uh, S uh, SGI, uh, micro double SGI, fast CGI, and it also can uh, talk to memcache directly. So uh, some of your applications may use uh, already upstream with memcache, for example, or uh, with fast CGI. What this means is that. Your engines connects directly to your application and you don't have another web server between. And uh, you can do load balancing even in this uh, situation, which is uh, you can have, uh, you can define a few, uh, a few, okay, application servers like FastGI or micro WSGI uh, servers with uh, upstream pass uh, usually uh, HGI, uh, SCGI uh, pass or micro double HGI uh, dash pass or fast CGI dash underscore uh, pass. So you define this and uh, you can define a single server there. But if you use upstream and define three, four, five, ten servers there, you can use the name that you give this upstream uh, to the pass directive here and actually get a load balancing there. And you can control this load balancing a little bit by using the uh, fast CGI, for example, if you're using fast CGI, fast CGI next server directive. This, with this directive, you can define what happens if uh, a request is not serviced in time. What? How long is that time? And uh, uh, should we go to the next server from the upstream? Also, if you are paying Nginx, the Russians are good. They uh, have a, a commercial ver uh, version of Nginx. Uh, you also get uh, this pretty nice module that uh, gives you dynamic updates for the upstream. This means that dynamically you can add and remove servers that are in the list for the servers to all balance from. And I really urge you, because we have done so for quite a few setups with uh, high available engines, write your own monitoring that uh, on each of the load balancers checks the web nodes or web applications, depending on how you have set up your uh, setup, okay? Uh, monitor if each web node is okay define your values for OK, meaning, uh, OK, maybe slow loading time for a request is not a problem for you, but maybe uh, 200 uh, simultaneous connections to a web application server are bad for this web application server. So define what you mean there. Uh, you can uh, check a lot of things because you have written your own monitoring for this. It's pretty easy to write uh, stuff like this. There are simple scripts like 100 lines of code. And when you detect something, you go here and update the configuration of your load balancer there. How you do that? You simply update the configuration file and kill Nginx. Kill doesn't mean that you kill the server. You send it uh, like, uh, I think help was for Nginx and it reloads the configuration file. It's not a problem, it reloads it without uh, stopping uh, any other work. So everything is still up, you simply change the configuration file, removed or added uh, one more upstream. This is what we are doing for uh, our customers. Uh, it's pretty easy. If you're interested, I actually can ask one of my colleagues that actually wrote the script to uh, push it on GitHub for, uh, for you. So, load balancing. Load balancing has a lot of options. Actually, I was thinking, okay, maybe those options are not of interest for you, but uh, I'm thinking now it's a good idea that I put them here. So uh, for each server that uh, you define in your configuration, and before I explain everything here, uh, where is my upstream config? I lost uh, a slide. Fuck. 
Uh, I was preparing the slides here, so I deleted one, unfortunately. So uh, you have a server you know, upstream is, uh, uh, let's pretend that we have the upstream word here. And uh, after that, you have a name, like <laughs> my backend. And then uh, you have brackets and define server. And for that server, you get an IP address. And uh, after that IP address, you have to define how the server will handle uh, requests. You can define for each server a wait. Wait is uh, a very good definition when uh, you have, for example, a web server that has uh, 64 gigabytes of RAM and a web server that has 128 gigabytes of RAM. And obviously, though, the second one would have more resources. Maybe you have even better CPUs on the second one. So you can define the first server with a weight of one and the second server with a weight of two. And uh, it will try to uh, go with, to send more uh, requests to the uh, second server. This way, with this number, you can configure how many requests you're sending to each server. This option is changing only the round, the round robin mechanism. Is there someone that doesn't know what the round robin is? <laughs> okay, uh, so the idea is that uh, since you're jumping from, host, uh, from uh, server to server, uh, the weights help to say how many uh, times you would jump on the same server. Uh, max files, uh, Nginx, is said that uh, is not checking uh, its backends. Uh, it was like this uh, maybe two years ago. Uh, now, uh, for each server, you can define how many failed requests you have. A failed request is when the Nginx cannot request you, uh, what you have requested from Nginx. It cannot request it from the web server or your web application. If it times out, this is uh, your situation uh, that you count one fail. And uh, you define what is the timeout that uh, you would wait for a request. If, for example, you say here, okay, I want uh, to have max five failed requests within two seconds. This means that uh, if this counter goes to uh, five in uh, two seconds, it will discard the server from the round robin mechanism and it will not send any more requests to this web server. This is nice. Then you can also configure uh, the server to be a backup. This means that this server uh, would not uh, have any requests to it until one of the other servers dies. This is a very nice idea. Uh, the, uh, storage guys have this with the whole spare hard drives for years. Finally, it came to the web servers and someone thought, okay, it's a good idea to have one or two web servers just on the site when the shit hit, hits the fan, right? You know. <laughs> so, uh, then we have the down. Uh, down definition means that you don't want a request to go to this server. Why the hell would you do that? This is when you do maintenance or upgrades. You want to remove one of the web nodes from uh, the list of servers that get requests, okay? You simply add down at the end of the server definition and you would never get requests to this uh, web server. Perfect. Then you have uh, maximum connections. There may be servers that have limited uh, resources and can handle maximum, for example, 100 simultaneous connections. Since uh, Nginx knows about this, Okay, it's perfect, you would configure it to uh, 100 and it will skip it when the counter is still 100. Then you have the resolve here. When I said server line, uh, I meant, okay, server IP. But uh, you can also replace the IP with uh, a host name. The problem with host names are, uh, is that they're resolved when uh, Nginx is started. So when you start Nginx, uh, this host uh, web1.simple.com, uh, it will resolve to a single IP. And uh, if you change the DNS record for this, uh, it, the, the wall balancer would never know that it changed. So with resolve, you tell it to uh, try to resolve it from time to time. Uh, how, how this works, uh, I'm, 
there is additional module for uh, additional configuration for this where you can configure should engines uh, use its own uh, resolver or using the uh, machine resolver and if it's uh, using its own resolver you can configure it uh, how often uh, you want it to resolve the other thing that uh, I actually read for the first time for this presentation is uh, start slow. I didn't know that uh, this option existed. When you're adding a new machine, so you're configuring uh, uh, your um, engine load balancer, and uh, for certain, okay, a machine failed for uh, a few times, so engine stopped sending web re uh, requests to this machine, right? But at certain point, it recovered. Machine, uh, engine sees that and starts sending the full amount of requests that uh, this machine can handle, like 200, 500, or so on. The problem is that if this machine just booted, it may still be loading stuff. So it, it's a little bit overloaded. And you are overloading it, so uh, you actually uh, can uh, freeze this machine as soon as uh, it woke up. <laughs> so it, it's not a very good idea. The idea here is to have slow start, uh, defines how many uh, seconds you want to uh, gradually increase uh, the amount of connections that you're sending to your web application or web servers. This allows you to configure pretty nice uh, each server in the, up, in the upstream definition in engines, which is very, very good. Uh, the problem again is uh, this picture here, because you have configured this machine and it doesn't know about this, uh, this machine. It knows that it has 200 connections to uh, the server down, but this one also is sending 200 connections. So now you have 400 connections and the web server is fucked by the two old balancers. So, after the sex there, we have to uh, decide uh, uh, how to, uh, to solve this. And uh, since your managers uh, come and say, okay, I want this fixed tonight. Uh, usually you uh, think, okay, but there is no option in engines that can share the state between two, the two old balancers. You don't need to share the state between the two world balancers. You need to have a good monitoring that you have written for your application, for your web servers, that can reconfigure the world balancers based on that. If you want this application to share knowledge between uh, common knowledge between uh, your world balancers, uh, I advise you to use uh, things like uh, Redis, uh, distributed Redis, uh, Zookeeper, or etcd. All of these services allow you to have key value stores distributed across uh, your machines and be sure that it's the same, consistent across all of your machines. So, uh, request distribution is usually done in uh, around Robin, but you can actually tweak it a bit. Like if you add uh, after, after the server definitions, if you simply add IP hash, this would mean that uh, one load balancer will check the client's IP address, the IP address that is coming from here to the load balancer, and uh, if this client here uh, received this web node, okay, let's say this web node, then all requests from this client would go to this web node until this web node dies. This is nice to keep uh, sessions and locality for uh, data like uh, stores and stuff like this, where you want to have local information in the, you're keeping local information in the web node, and this allows you all the clients to go to the same web node until the web node dies, okay? Uh, the other thing is hash. Hash is a little strange string. Uh, if have any one of you, oh, uh, have any one of you uh, done uh, proxying with uh, engines? Proxy, reverse proxy, very little, very few. Okay, uh, the idea is that you can define, for example, uh, header information. Like if, for example, define cookie as a header. Okay, it's a header, and if all the cookies match. They would, they would go to the same uh, web node. If the cookies differ, they would go to a new node. That's uh, the idea with hash. 
you can define cookies, you can define uh, whatever option uh, variable um, Nginx gives you, like uh, protocol, like remote client, like uh, uh, everything, URI, uh, URI, everything. So hash is pretty powerful. Uh, a lot of people are actually using hash instead of round robin or IP hash because uh, this allows them to predict where each request will go. It's pretty nice. Then you have list connections, so the web server or web application with uh, the list connections. And then you have uh, last time. Last time is a little bit trickier. First, you have uh, a situation where you define a header. Like, for example, I have created my uh, strange header uh, x-finished. When the Nginx receives this header, uh, it times the time between the request it sent to the web application and uh, when it received your header. So if this time change for some, uh, for some reason, uh, it would decide that, uh, okay, it increases, it would decide to uh, put less connections on this machine. Instead of using header, if you don't want to use header or you can't use header in your application, you can say bytes, uh, which is, uh, it, it's not bytes, it's uh, actually, uh, what was it, last uh, underscore bytes is the uh, proper parameter here. Uh, when you do this, Nginx will check the whole size of uh, your request and uh, Based on this, it will decide uh, should we, uh, was it fast or slow, and uh, should we uh, move the connections to another node. Uh, then we also have keep alive. Now, what, uh, since you, most of the time you would be using uh, HTTP 1.1 to your web servers, if you're connecting to web servers, uh, your connection will stay open, uh, the connection from the <coughs> the connection from the load balancer to your web server uh, will stay open and engines will reuse it. But uh, if you had a, a search of traffic for your website, a lot of these connections will stay idle for a lot of time and you're simply losing resources both on the load balancer and on the web servers for idle connections. So keep alive is a definition. After that, you define time like 120 seconds or 20 seconds. and if this time passes and no request is going through this connection, this connection would be severed and uh, uh, you release the, um, the resources. Then you also have health check. With health check, you can define a check, and this I will show you. Uh, you can define a health check interval, how, uh, how often you want it. And for example, you are right, uh, health check has a few more options, like five more options. And uh, Nginx will go to this uh, URI on your web server uh, every one sec uh, every second and to check the status of uh, the reply status of your web server if it is between 200 and uh, 399. I assume most of you know what uh, 200 is. And also it will check if uh, the body of the response that you get is not maintenance mode. So you haven't uh, start enabled maintenance mode on your uh, web nodes. If this is okay, then this uh, server is fine. If uh, these checks are not okay, it will disable your uh, server from the upstream directly. This is very nice, very good. Actually, this helps you to solve the other problem, but uh, not entirely. Also, you have uh, queue where uh, if all of your web nodes for some reason uh, have handled, uh, have reached their connection limit and uh, you cannot send any more requests to, uh, to them, uh, should Nginx uh, directly drop the request or queue it? If you define queue with certain number, uh, it will try to wait for a server to, uh, to be available for this amount of time and everything is fine. Uh, sticky cook, uh, cookie. <laughs> 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 I, I woke you up. <laughs> uh, sticky cookie is another option where uh, you can define uh, a cookie that uh, one, uh, you want to be checked. So 
engines will send this cookie uh, transparently uh, from the load balancer to the, uh, to the web servers, and the web servers uh, will uh, the web servers to the web clients, and the clients will obviously every time uh, convey the cookie again. So this way. Uh, you can see which client went to which uh, uh, load balancer. You can uh, match them. You can do that uh, with uh, without header. It's pretty easy, but uh, some people want it to be vi visible, in, uh, so they did the sticky cookie option. So load balancing is fine, very very nice, but. Uh, since you already have a web server like Nginx that can do all of these things for you, can do SNI, uh, it's uh, very fast and efficient, you can also do caching inside of it. So uh, instead of using your CPU cycles only for role balancing, the request is already there and you have the resources, you can actually cache the static content. This is the at least what you can do. You should cache the uh, static content there because uh, this way, no request will go to your uh, web nodes that uh, have to go then uh, to the storage and get your pictures, uh, CSS and JavaScript and so on files that you haven't changed. If they change, that's not a problem. Uh, Nginx would know. You define uh, how often uh, it has to check for each resource. And uh, Nginx will update the information if it changed. Also, uh, there is something, uh, I'll talk about this later. I want to talk about the stale caching. Uh, th there are, we handle a few sites that uh, have enormous web traffic. And uh, for them, when, for example, one of the sites is the biggest sporting site in Spain. And uh, when Real Madrid and Barcelona have uh, a match, <laughs> it's interesting for our infrastructure. So, uh, this guy doesn't have a very optimized site. Uh, actually, it's very poorly written. So uh, the infrastructure is the one that suffers. It's not his website. We suffer because all of these requests are coming, and there are a lot. It's half of Spain is watching this match, and uh, the other half is uh, watching it on uh, the phone, refreshing the web page, right? And this web page is on our infrastructure, and uh, it takes seconds to load some of these pages. Seconds. This means that uh, we can handle like uh, okay, ten thousand requests and then we are done. <laughs> but uh, what if we can uh, cache the whole page for a second, just for a second, on the world balancers, static page, and we ship it to everyone that is refreshing? We skip like uh, ninety percent of the traffic. We just simply deliver it directly from memory. And uh, Nginx allows you to uh, configure it in such a way that uh, I think I have it here. You stay on cache here, okay? Uh, you can configure Nginx to use stale cache only if there are errors from your web servers. So, okay, some of the web servers started to turn in errors because of the high load. No problem, we'll give you the static page. <laughs> you would not feel it. Actually, the users on the site, the editors on the site have never felt it. You simply say here, like, one second, and you're done. Perfect. You also can uh, configure it to, uh, with different options here. If uh, it timed out, it uh, returned error. It, uh, if uh, some of the headers were uh, invalid. Uh, and you can say how much time uh, you have to keep this, uh, this header. So uh, pretty nice caching mechanism. Uh, then uh, I should talk a little bit about uh, edge site includes. Uh, does any one of you know what edge site includes is? Server site includes? Okay, so the idea here is that you have uh, a web page like Amazon, where uh, this is a shop, very nice shop, perfect, but the problem with the, this shop is that uh, on the left side, there's, uh, there are some, uh, there's a menu that doesn't change a lot, but uh, you get different menu depending on where you're coming from. Then on the right side and on the bottom, you actually have uh, 
uh, attributes there, uh, you see something that was prepared just for you, for your IP address, with all the information Amazon has for you. So they're trying to give you propositions for what to buy, right? Perfect. The problem is that uh, now you cannot cache this page because some parts of it are now dynamically generated. But the center page, the landing page, and the menu are static for certain resources. You, with edge site includes, you can define what is static on your page and what is dynamic. And uh, the cache server, the proxy server, would request only the dynamic uh, content from your web servers and uh, would uh, response uh, would give the client the static cache of the rest of the page, which is perfect for you because now you can separate your page on four, five, ten parts and uh, get uh, the dynamic content from different uh, web servers. Uh, and uh, if someone wants to work on uh, Nginx uh, ACI module, uh, I'm willing to help there. So uh, since I don't have uh, time anymore, uh, just this is the proxy configuration uh, when you want to cache something and thank you.